Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us uh, tonight in Israel and this uh, afternoon almost in the US. Um, my name is Elad, I'm the Global Business Development Manager at Colo. Um, and I'll be happy to host you tonight. I have here many co-pilots, as you can all see. Uh, before we will start, I would like uh, to give the, the microphone to Ariella Rada, the Council for Academic and uh, Communities Affairs, also oversees the Israel Consulate to the uh, Midwest Economic Department. So thank you very much, Ariella, actually, for uh, putting this webinar together. We really appreciate your help and support. And please. Thank you, Elad. And uh, good afternoon, everyone here. And good night or uh, good evening to everybody in Israel. And thank you, of course, for joining us and welcome. Um, we are really pleased to have another unique webinar. Uh, that is highlighting another sector of the Israeli innovation ecosystem. I'm sure that you all know the phrase that necessity is the mother of innovation. In the case of Israel, this phrase is definitely true and is being implemented in different sectors. As an example for that innovative spirit, we are happy to collaborate and present today three Israeli companies dealing with smart city solutions, Colo, Zan City, and urban leap. I believe these companies, like many others in Israel, developed sustainable solutions for cities' recoveries from the COVID-19 economic impact. Those of you who, not, who might not know uh, the Israeli consulate to Israel to the Midwest is overseeing uh, nine states. Our main goal is, of course, to enhance the relationship between Israel and the Midwest in different sectors, such, such as academic, um, politics, culture, and mainly economics. One of my and my economic team main efforts at the consulate is not only to bring Midwestern technologies to assist with challenges that Israel is facing, but rather also bring Israeli innovative uh, solutions to assist with challenges that Midwestern cities, states, and governments are facing. If you are interested in connecting with any of the companies about to present, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Of course, once the, uh, the uh, program will be done, a follow-up email will be sent to all of you. And of course, we're here to assist uh, with anything that you need. I'm sure you will all find this webinar interesting and relevant. And I'm happy to pass, of course, to Elad the spotlight as it is Everything is, everything is around the smart cities and new technologies, so please take it away. Thank you very much, Ariella. And as I said, we're uh, really, really appreciating your efforts here. Um, so uh, just a few ground rules. We'll start uh, with the first speaker will be Michael Mazur, the VP for Business Development uh, at Colu. Each one of the uh, speakers will take up to 12 minutes. And in the end, we have a section of Q&A. Uh, if you have any technical issues or any questions, you, of course, can write it down on the chat box, and I will try to answer during the webinar. And we will share and publish this video. We will start to record it just in one second. So um, we will uh, share every, uh, the whole webinar uh, online and on our social media channels. And without further ado, uh, Michael Mazur uh, from Colo. Hey guys, thanks a lot. Um, I'm very happy to be here and speaking uh, on behalf of Colo. I'm actually in New York City and uh, you know, things are finally getting a little better here uh, in a lot of senses. Uh, I think again, this is a great uh, opportunity to, to talk and I think with everything going on here in the US, um, it's, it's very important to present how technology can help cities. Uh, I know we're going through unprecedented uh, challenging times and, and so, what we're doing now is really trying to see how we can see the, the social issues and the other issues that are currently um, in front of everyone and seeing how we can also adapt our technology to help cities uh, immediately. And so I will share our screen on my screen. Elad, can you see it or can everyone see the screen? Okay, yes. cool. So I'll, I'll quickly just tell you guys a little bit about us. Um, 
we as a company, Kolo, have been around for almost five years. And up until about uh, nine months ago or so, our main focus was on uh, Israel and uh, Europe. And right now, our main focus is on the U.S. market. What we do is we work with cities. We're a gov tech platform. And we offer cities a white label city branded app that the whole concept is that it rewards residents' behavior that meets the strategic goals of the cities. We see that one of the biggest uh, voids in the market right now with cities is that cities don't really necessarily have a mechanism to reward resident action. And there's typically a big disconnect between how cities have their goals and how they can really use technology to achieve them. And right now with COVID-19, one of the main focuses has been also how we can help and use technology to reward residents for shopping at local businesses. So I'll talk a little bit more about that. And this is a little bit just from a higher level of what's going on today, right? So right now in the U.S. market, uh, a lot of funding is coming in through the CARES Act. Funding is coming in either directly to residents of uh, cities in the form of uh, unemployment insurance or economic impact benefits and payments, or directly to small businesses in the form of loans and grants. And what we see, obviously this is great, but these funds are one-time solutions to help support and save businesses now. These funds that are coming in are not long-term solutions. And what we really see another void in here is how do we look and get people and residents to actually shop at local businesses. We believe that if we can incentivize residents to shop locally, that will create a long-term sustainable and organic approach to help these small businesses survive and thrive post-pandemic. So a lot of our focus is seeing how we can reward local shopping and how we can make sure that these small businesses aren't just getting, you know, one-time payment, but have a healthy long-term plan to survive and thrive. And, you know, a big question that we always ask is ultimately, how do we encourage residents to buy their shampoo from a local business and not on Amazon, right? Like, what would it take? And we'll talk a little bit more about how, what our, how our platform works and the incentives and everything. But ultimately, when you look at the numbers, right now, the average U.S. resident spends about $50 per month on Amazon. And if you look at a city such as Sacramento, this is an example of a, a concrete example, um, and you take about 15, 1.5% of their purchases that were made on Amazon and convert them to purchases made at local businesses, in a city like Sacramento that has about 500,000 residents, that's about $93 million of additional revenue towards local businesses. Now, you know, everyone today talks about the um, loans and grants and all that, but when you think about it, this is an organic way to really shift purchases to local businesses. And then obviously you think about it, more jobs, more uh, job retention, more revenue, and then more small businesses are obviously the immediate impact. But a lot of times we don't even realize that the answer may be right in front of us. So we're really looking to see how can we shift these purchases to be made at local businesses and what will it take to really get residents to change their behavior so that they can do this? Because the benefits are clear. One more thing is certain cities also have municipal sales tax, right? So from a municipal sales tax perspective, that's also additional direct revenue to the city, right? So there's a lot of positive uh, impacts and implications for this. And now the question is, how do we get there? So what our app does is, like I was mentioning, it's a white label app for cities. It's branded with the city. And it's powered by a city coin. The city coin is like a point system similar to like credit card points or airline points. As you engage in behaviors that meet the city's goals, you then get rewarded with a city coin. And we call it, it's like a circular economy. On one hand, we're incentivizing the behavior, and then people are rewarded with the city coin that can only be used at businesses within the city. And we call it concepts of gamification and behavioral economics to see how we can ultimately drive resident behaviors to change, but also to continue past the incentive. So just a little bit about how the app works is it works really with, we call it urban stories, different challenges and initiatives that go on in the city that help the cities achieve goals. One may be shopping at businesses downtown. If that's a strategic goal of the city, maybe for each time someone purchases at these businesses downtown, they'll be rewarded 
with 10% cash back in the form of a city coin. So they spend $10 at a business downtown, they'll get one coin back. And then as they accumulate these coins, they can then redeem them at the local business. But the cool thing is that right now, each initiative is focused on a different use case. So it could be right now an initiative that focuses on a minority owned businesses. So there can be an incentive or an initiative that says, hey, anyone who shops in the next month at a minority owned business will get 15% cash back. And it's really seeing what the city wants and how we can reward it using city coins. And there's a few other things. We obviously can also reward things like volunteering efforts, communication efforts, and any other thing that the city wants in terms of even mobility, saying how do we encourage people to take public transportation instead of their own car. All these things can be rewarded with city coins. And that's something that the city really can have the ability to say, hey, this is what we want to achieve. And we'll work with them through the app to give them the platform to enable them to do so. So that's, again, from a higher level how this works. And more about the urban stories. And that's a cool way for us really to show residents they open the app and they see what's going on in the city. They see the different initiatives and rewards programs like shopping local, shopping at minority owned businesses. They can also see the different events that are going on. They can see the different types of um, initiatives that are going on that may not relate directly to purchasing at small businesses. It could be, like I said, a volunteering effort. It could be an effort to uh, encourage people to watch clips that relate to best practices and safety and other things like that. Um, one other thing that we want to always focus on is we say, hey, how do we get people to shop at these small businesses? And one of the main disconnects is that people don't necessarily know the story behind the small businesses. So it's very important for us also to allow the small businesses and to give them a platform to tell their story and to let people really feel connected to those businesses that are right around them. A lot of times it's a problem with awareness. So that's another part of the story section. And again, we focus a lot on gamification. We want to, we call it a, sort of like a, a cycle, right? We want to get people to feel acknowledged when they get rewarded. We want people to feel like they're also conducting a sequence of the of events until they get rewarded. So it could be a shop at a small business uh, in a certain district four times in a week and then get rewarded. All these different concepts that celebrate achievements that really feel like you're constantly in the sequence of challenges in order to reach an objective get you to use the app more and that's part of the behavioral economics uh, concept. And on top of that, it's very important for us also to say, hey, like, you're a city hero. You are contributing to your local residents, to your local businesses, to your, the local economy. People want to feel like they're contributing. And even if it's in a small way, we want people to show it and to feel it and to understand it and then to share it with their friends. Right? That's the whole point here. And uh, on top of that, we say, okay, this is really how the cycle works. Uh, we have a city. The city defines the goal and they define challenges. Um, the residents have the app they can take advantage of those challenges, purchase at the small businesses, uh, volunteer and so forth, and get rewarded with coins. And then the residents can use those coins to shop at these businesses that are local. From the business perspective, what we do is we drive traffic to the business for the city, and the city can say, hey, we're giving the businesses a platform to use to have so that residents are aware of what's going on in the city and that they feel more inclined and aware of their ability to shop there and to contribute to their local economy. And then the cool part is also that we encourage different types of partnerships with city, with uh, corporate partners, with foundations, to really focus on specific use cases. It could be use cases related to public health, saying, hey, walk 10,000 steps per day and then get rewarded. Could be things like transportation, as I mentioned, and really seeing how we can make an impact that is long-term on the city and keep it that way, change the behavior. Uh, I will say we are launching uh, in Akron, Ohio in the upcoming month, and that's going to be our, our first uh, U.S. city that we're launching in and that we're going to start with. One of our main focuses in Akron is on minority and women-owned businesses. The city really wants to see, number one, how they can help those businesses. And on the other hand, the city wants to boost the local morale. And that's a big part of what we're doing is we're coming in and we're going to help the city show the businesses, show the residents that they are taking action to help. Um, one other thing is that we have been approved uh, for the 90-day economic recovery plan in Chula Vista, California. So really seeing how we can utilize and leverage funds that come in from the government to help these cities recover and obviously thrive post-pandemic. 
And so again, we're doing this in Tel Aviv and uh, the past few months, we have had uh, immense success, I would say, in terms of the economic impact of these incentives. We see that people now are shopping locally more than they were otherwise. Small businesses that are part of the program say that about 30% of their economic activity came from Kolo users at these difficult times. Um, and on top of that, we're really trying to innovate quickly as we go and as we see. So for example, we saw that a lot of businesses that inherently didn't deliver now started to deliver arts and craft stores and businesses that um, convenience stores and so forth. So we aggregated the list and then the city incentivized those purchases. And that's what really helped spark more and more local purchasing. Um, and then the behavior, what's cool is even continues after the reward is there, right? So we initially incentivize, the city incentivizes 10%, 15% cash back. But the whole point is that even once the incentive is exercised, people will still continue purchasing more at those businesses. And again, we're big into the data. We want to make sure cities know uh, what's going on. How can they really get the best ROI? How can they really see and understand what their impact was? And also how we can improve the program for the city. So a big part of it is getting the data, understanding how people are interacting with uh, the different incentives and how we can improve it to make sure that we continue and incentivize businesses and help, again, promote local shopping. And that's pretty much it. Michael, just because you finished one minute before uh, the time, uh, Sherry asked, um, who decides which businesses are included? Uh, for example, who, what are the local businesses and what is the revenue model of the company? So the businesses that we select, it's typically our initial phases with the municipalities is conducting a deep strategy dive with them to determine what are the initial um, neighborhoods or parts of the city that we want to focus on and then we focus on businesses within that uh, neighborhood or area or it could also be the specific segments it could be restaurants it could be arts and crafts stores it could be educational facilities whatever we we want to focus on with the city and that's part of what we help in terms of our deep market research dive um, we get paid a fee for the app itself for the it's called the software as a service fee so that's how we uh, get paid by the city Great. So maybe you'll address it more in the Q&A se section. Thank you very much. Sure. And of course, we'll be happy to elaborate on uh, calls with you, with you guys. Um, let me uh, pass the mic to Eyal from Zen City. I actually uh, knew Eyal, met Eyal even before getting to my current position in Kolo, and he's considered as one of the leaders of the smart city space in Israel. So... Uh, a lot, of, a lot to learn from Eyal about everything that's going on in GovTech. So Eyal, please. Oh, thank you, Alad. I'm, I'm blushing now after that intro. Uh, and thank you, Michael, for the previous presentation. That was super interesting. Um, I'd love to share my screen uh, and share a few slides with you. Michael, if you can stop sharing yours, uh, that'll be helpful so I can get started. Um, so hi, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for taking the time this evening, uh, this afternoon, sorry, and joining us. I, I, the thing I want to start with before diving into talking a little bit about Zen City and the work that we're doing is to address all the local government people on the line today and just say thank you. I think that local governments are very much on the front lines of dealing with all the crises, uh, both the COVID-19 uh, crisis and the evolving nature of it from handling social distancing in the pandemic all the way to reopening now, as well as the challenges the communities are going through right now uh, over the past two weeks. Um, so we see ourselves a lot, first and foremost, as an ally to the important work that local governments have to do on a daily basis. And I think that that became so much more important uh, over the past few months. So seriously, just um, the purpose of everything that I'm gonna share today is a little bit about how we try to be a good ally um, to uh, local governments in, in delivering that important service that you deliver to your communities and thank you so much for uh, taking an hour out of your busy schedules and joining the webinar today. Um, a little bit about Zen City as a company. Uh, we've been around for the past uh, uh, four years or so and today I'm happy to say we work with about 140 different communities across the US. Uh, a lot of them in the Midwest from cities as big as Chicago and Aurora all the way to tiny communities like the village of Lamont, Illinois or the town of Blue Ash, Ohio, uh, including cities like Dayton, Kalamazoo, and many, many others across the entire region. Um, and I'm very, very excited to say that we impact about 35 million people 
across all these different communities and across the country. Our goal is very simple. As I said, our starting point is that local government's work is super important. And one of the things that makes it, make it so important is the variety of responsibilities the local government organizations have from things such as infrastructure and transportation to public safety and all the complexities that go along with that, all the way to cultural activities, waste management and park maintenance, local governments provide crucial services to the communities that they serve. And one of the main challenges that this diversity of services creates is that the people that manage these organizations, city managers, mayors, county administrators, they have a huge challenge of prioritizing. How do we decide what is more important than what? How do we decide what is um, the most important service that we should be focusing our efforts and resources? And that becomes so much more important in the current reality of budget cuts across the board when we're um, losing revenue from sales tax and other sources. Understanding what are the main priorities becomes a crucial need on every manager's table. And when we ask city managers and mayors, how do you prioritize? How do you decide between investing in a new um, uh, uh, infrastructure project or in renovating that park down, downtown or in you know, um, uh, uh, adding a new squad car? The answer is almost always the same. We look at what are the things that are most important to our community. And we try to look at data that comes with it. And when we ask them, how do you measure um, the things that are most important to your community? How do you get that data? The answer is almost always the same. We use tools like town hall meetings or phone surveys or um, inviting people to give comment uh, in the city council meetings. And all these tools are often limited to what one of the city managers we work with calls the STP problem, the same 20 people that come to every town hall, every community meeting, every engagement opportunity. This makes all these tools somewhat anecdotal um, and really missing the mark, especially of that data-driven approach that we so value today in the management of complex organizations such as cities. And to that problem is exactly uh, what we've tailored our solution. Zen City's goal is very simple. We wanna help the people running these organizations, the people at the helm in counties and cities uh, across different local government organizations, be able to quantify and understand the needs and priorities of their community by listening to that silent majority of voices uh, across their community. And that means that we basically look at conversations that are already taking place, whether it's in the city's own customer service data, like 311 calls or emails that they're getting, whether it's conversations on public social media uh, outlets, and whether it's even mentions in the news or in broadcast media, we loop in all these conversations. And just for reference in Chicago, that's about, uh, about 2 million conversations every month. Uh, we bring in all of that data and with machine learning with, we developed with some AI magic, we turn all of that unstructured data into a scorecard so the city can very easily track and see here are the things that our community cares about the most. Here is their sentiment, their reaction towards that, their level of satisfaction if you'd like. And here are the main drivers that help us understand why. And all that is available to the leaders that we work with through uh, an easy to use app and mobile device. Um, that uh, uh, they can access on the go wherever they are or from their computer through their browser if they'd like. Um, what I want to take the time and do today very quickly is run through a few examples from our network of, uh, of 100 plus communities of how they've used us specifically to address the unique challenges the local governments are facing in light of COVID-19. Um, the first thing that we did as a team as we started getting these requests as we started hearing about the challenges that cities are facing is stop all of our roadmap and focus completely on COVID-19 response. And one of the first things that came out of it is a set of new features led by what we call the COVID-19 dashboard, which became a one-stop shop for really understanding the community needs and priorities around COVID-19. And in a reality where sentiment is changing on a daily basis, and on the other hand, um, cities need to make crucial life-changing decisions on a daily basis, such as investing in local businesses and helping them stay afloat or serving the communities uh, that are most at risk, having a one place to see what do people care about, what are people happy with and unhappy with, are we missing any important priority of our community, has become a daily need uh, for uh, the wide majority of our users and customers. And I wanna give you just a few examples of how that's used. One of the um, 
first uh, things we saw is that there is a real need, as I said, for that timely feedback for things uh, in real time. And we saw a host of different use cases around that timely feedback, whether it's informing strategic policy, like making decisions such as um, what Michael shared before in Chula Vista, deciding how to address the 90 day uh, recovery plan, whether it's around shaping messaging on the different initiatives and getting the community on board with them. One of the unique uh, aspects of this challenge is that we need a lot of community cooperation um, to run through COVID-19 and whether it's recognizing um, specific issues or even specific examples of misinformation and tackling them head on to make sure the community gets the best service. And one of the first examples that I wanted to share with you is from a small town in Connecticut where um, the uh, community decided, the city council decided to uh, close down most of the recreational facilities, but left the golf course open. Their logic was, hey, the golf course is a place where you can easily social distance, let's keep it open. And in response to that decision, we could show them with our data that there was a huge negative backlash from their community about uh, keeping the golf course open, mainly because people said that the patterns of behavior in the golf course are ones that don't keep social distancing and that that opens up uh, a, a wide variety of risk for their community. And based on that data, uh, the city manager brought that forth to the city council. And the same day, city council decided to close the golf course as well and got very, very positive feedback from their community. Another example is around, again, shaping policy around social distancing. For example, in one of the bigger cities we serve uh, down south, um, the mayor really wanted to increase their enforcement of social distancing policies. Basically, she wanted to um, make sure to uh, hand out fines or really enforce people not keeping social distancing back in April. And she got a lot of negative backlash from her staff saying that people will be very much against this. People will be angry about this. And then her chief of staff looked at our data um, and saw that uh, there was a wider support for increasing uh, enforcement around social distancing than there was a negative uh, sentiment towards that. And based on that data, she could easily get the support of the other council members, of the city staff, of the police department, and uh, start enforcing social distancing and keeping the health of the community that uh, she was elected to serve. Another example is around shaping messaging. So in a crisis like this, as I mentioned before, where we need cooperation from our community, putting out the right message, getting people to be on board, getting people to, um, as Michael shared, change their behavior, um, and uh, um, react to the things that the city wants to react is a lot about messaging. How do we tell the story in a way that makes it compelling to them? And these two examples are places where um, city leaders saw in our data that their messaging was off in different ways. For example, one of the mayors that we work with or one of the, probably one of the top five metros in the US put out very, very elaborate messaging around um, social distancing and almost all the feedback he got was regarding rent. People were very, very frustrated that the city did not address the issue of um, a rent moratorium or any um, you know, remedy for people that need to pay their rent. And that was a whole issue that he missed in his messaging. We shared that with him immediately. And in the same day, he put out, he um, started a task force around rent and changed the city's policy um, around that. Uh, and with that, the messaging that he put out there. So a lot of the examples around messaging, don't have time to go into all of them, but, uh, but we'll see a couple of examples a little bit further. Um, and, and what I wanna show now is a few specific case studies um, with specific communities uh, that, that really did something unique with our platform during COVID-19. The first was with a small town in Massachusetts, town of Winthorpe, a uh, small town outside of Boston, right by Logan Airport. And they had a challenge that I'm guessing a lot of local governments face. They had to, um, promote a big infrastructure project during the COVID-19 uh, time. And one of the challenges for them was that um, the, the infrastructure project itself demanded about 12 hours of a water shutdown in a few streets across, uh, across the town. In a reality where we're all quarantined uh, and can't leave the house, having a water shutdown for 12 hours is something that is complicated. Maybe in regular days, that's okay, but when you're stuck at home, can't you know, uh, flush the toilet at work instead of at home. Um, it's complicated to not have water for 12 hours. And the city did not think about that. They went along with the plan of carrying out the infrastructure project as planned before. But when they announced it, they got a lot of negative uh, feedback on our platform. They got about 51% uh, of all the conversations that had to do with the project. And we're talking about thousands of conversations in a town of about 15,000 people. 51% of them were negative. 
Based on that, the city manager was alerted by our platform, this is going on. He actually changed the uh, project plan itself and changed the times of the work, made it so that there was no need to um, stop the water for more than two hours uh, for any of the residents. And when he announced that change, there was only 15% negative sentiment uh, to the project in the weeks to follow and until the project was carried out and completed. So here we saw a great example of how a decision maker took that input from the, his community, made an actual change to the project itself, and then uh, got uh, the ROI in terms of support from his community to carry out the project that he um, uh, had to, uh, uh, to execute. So that's one example from Massachusetts. Another with uh, the city of Austin, Texas, uh, 11th largest city in the country. Um, and one of the things that they were facing is actually a messaging issue. They put out um, a lot of uh, information about how the city is dealing with uh, COVID-19 and changing policy. And, and interestingly enough, they got a huge spike in negative sentiment when they announced uh, some of their policies. And almost all that negative sentiment was related to how the city was dealing with the homeless population. There is a, unfortunately a large homeless population in, in the city of Austin and almost 40% of all, all negative mentions to the city's policy had to do directly with um, uh, the homeless population. Just to give you a sense of the volumes we're talking about, we're talking about uh, about 19,000 comments in a day that were picked up by our platform. Um, the issue here was that the city actually had a very elaborate homeless policy that had to do with COVID-19. They just didn't communicate it as part of their policies. So all they had to do here was not, as in the case of Winthrop, change their project, but actually just tweak their messaging. And the day after, they put out uh, a series of posts, a series of, of, of uh, announcements regarding to the city's homeless population, and that immediately relieved almost all the negative feedback across the city's channels. So that's another example from the last few weeks with the city of Austin. And last but not least, um, uh, the last case study I want to share is uh, with uh, uh, the town of uh, the township of, of Cranberry Township in Pennsylvania, uh, where they actually used their data to really shape how they're going to react to event cancellations uh, that had to do with COVID-19. One of the things they saw is when they announced the first round of event cancellations, they actually got very, very negative um, feedback from their community. As you can see here to the left, about 31% of all of the comments to the first round of event cancellations um, was very, very negative. And the city took a strong hit. This is a small community, usually, People are very supportive of the local government and uh, the city was surprised to see um, so much negative feedback to, to their actions. They thought it was you know, clear cut. There was COVID-19, we can't do the summer events. That makes complete sense. Um, but the type of feedback that they got, the specific message really related to them that they were off in their messaging. They didn't explain to their residents why the decision was made, what was the data behind it, how are they looking at future events, et cetera, et cetera. And based on that, they shaped the messaging of the second round of cancellations a lot differently. And as you can see from the numbers, that messaging really resonated much better with their community with about 41% negative sentiment in, in relation to about 3% um, uh, negative sentiment. So, so quite a big change in how that message was received by their community. And I think that beyond you know, just getting likes on Facebook or, or whatnot, in a crisis like COVID-19 and in any crisis really, trust in the local government, trust in the people uh, championing the community through is a crucial asset um, for a community to um, strive through that challenge. And the ability to get positive sentiment from your community, to get the message resonating is crucial capability in managing this crisis. And the last thing I wanna share with you and with that I'll finish, Elad, sorry if I'm a little bit over, is um, uh, as I said in the beginning, it's very important for us to give back to the community of local governments as a whole. So one of the things we've been doing on a routine basis throughout this crisis is put out data reports of trends we see across all of our customers. One of the latest ones we put out is uh, around reopening. How are people talking about reopening? What are their main priorities across the uh, 100 plus cities we serve across the country? Um, and interestingly enough, we saw that this issue uh, before um, the last two weeks where conversation shifted a little bit, this issue was top of mind to people. People were already talking about reopening as the main thing uh, out of all the COVID-19 discussion. About 25% of all mentions of COVID-19 had to do with reopening and how we're reopening. Um, and what we saw, interestingly enough, is what are people talking about when they're talking about reopening? So very clearly, we saw that entertainment venues and restaurants were um, the areas that got the most attention when it comes to uh, efforts around reopening in the city. 
And that's interesting because our assumption was that uh, parks and beaches will be the main thing that people are pushing to reopen. Uh, some of that explanation um, in our perspective comes from the fact that some of the parks and beaches were open and people were very, uh, uh, very much waiting for entertainment venues and restaurants to be open. Um, so that's definitely something to consider if, there, uh, uh, if you're thinking about reopening in your town, that these are um, places where people see a lot of attention to. And the last thing we saw, we're looking at specifically what type of businesses people are looking to reopen. By far, um, beauty salons was the issue that people were discussing the most, people, the issue where people were requesting the most to be open as fast as possible. So when shaping your policy for your town, that's definitely something to consider. Um, thank you very much for listening and uh, having me today. And if we can support your community, your efforts around reopening, uh, your efforts around big decisions you have to make uh, with community sentiment, feel free to reach out and we'd love to see how we can support you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Eyal. This is always super interesting. And actually, I also was waiting for the beauty salon to open. And today, I <laughs> my first haircut after four months or so after my wife uh, did it for me. She was great, but I never you'd never change your uh, hairstylist. So definitely uh, for this. And now I want to turn it over to Arik uh, from Urban Leap. And this is actually interesting because Urban Leap kind of meets the cities in an earlier stage. Uh, when you know that you're looking for innovation and uh, you want to start, but then there's so many companies, there's so many things out there, and I think that Urban Leap uh, kind of uh, found the right way to do it and to give a lot of information and uh, uh, to spur a lot of headaches uh, for city executives. So, Eric, thank you very much for joining us tonight. So, and, and thank you, Elad, for this uh, kind word. Um, so I'm, I'm based in, in Palo Alto and I'm, I'm happy to serve uh, uh, some of the biggest uh, agencies in the Midwest, uh, including uh, Cuyahoga County and uh, Planet M the, the, from the state of Michigan. Um, and maybe I will just start with my personal story. And, and I was working in government. I was working in government for five years. And, uh, and it was so the, I, I saw the impact. I saw the potential of the government uh, in the public sector. But now that I'm working in, the, in startups, I can see the potential of this collaboration uh, and how the innovation in startups can help government to move faster. And basically this is what we are trying to do. We are basically, our goal is to help local governments to adopt innovation, uh, to find the best solutions, to understand how they can help the cities and actually solve the toughest problems in governments. We, we basically understand that the process that governments are doing is discovering those solutions, then evaluate them, and then procure them. And we are building the processes uh, for the governments to actually do it better and faster. Um, so I'm going to show you in this short presentation, what are we doing? And then I'm going to show you a few uh, case studies, both on COVID-19 and not COVID-19, to show you how we are doing it and how we support different local governments in different case studies. So let's dive into it. So the first thing is that we understand is that the world is moving really, really fast. That means that there are more and more technologies out there, all the way from smart mobility to uh, cyber, and, um, and, and much more. Uh, but on the other hand, the level of problems and complexities are becoming, uh, are becoming more and more complex and it's becoming harder and harder. And basically what we, are trying, what we understand is that most of those innovation projects, all those hard complex uh, projects are failing uh, or they don't even understand what to do and how to do it. And the reason is, uh, there are many reasons, but basically if you need to sum up is one, of those problems are really hard. Uh, if you are thinking about um, uh, mobility in, in downtown or uh, parking, if you are thinking about how to think about COVID-19, so many new challenges that are just, just new. Uh, if you are thinking about now the, 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 the economic crisis, how to deal with that, uh, and all the problems that Zensity and, and Elad and, and Kulu are speaking about, but there are so many others. 
And the second, the, the, the second issue is the solution. The solutions are not simple. Uh, it's not easy to understand what's the best way to approach it and what are, what can, what are the new technologies that are out there that can actually support it. And the third thing is maybe it's, it's, it's hard to say, but it's, there are some capability gaps in governments all the way from culture to actually processes and tools. Uh, I think that what we understand is that governments need some help with those internal processes. And this is what we are doing. We build the government's workflow tools that help them to manage this whole process. Um, so, so if you think about it in really high level, the first thing is the ability to discover. We have, we have a customer success that really work hand with hand with the government and using the best practices. Now we are working with more than 80 agencies we can help the governments to identify their problem and then share it with the with with the public with the private sector and then we have the government to vet it so we have literally scorecards but it's remote scorecard everyone from his home can be part of a team that vet uh, those solutions and decide which one do you want to actually implement and then we help the government to actually track those solutions um, and evaluate the things that are most important, those goals um, and those and the ROI. So let's dive into dive into the to the actual things. So basically, we are creating an intake form for the government. Um, we are collecting the proposals. We, we help them to score, or this government is scoring, um, and then converting those proposals into deployment. And basically, what we are seeing is that the governments are uh, getting exposure to the best solutions that are out there. We help them to standardize the, evalu the evaluation process. So the different departments are doing, are using the same method and the city manager and the mayor have one place to see all the innovation um, in, the, in, the, in the city in one place. And we also help the city to prioritize based on ROI. And then once the, the project is out there, we help them to track the results and evaluate it. And one more thing that we understand is that it's very important for the government to actually document the process and make sure that it's equal and you can show uh, if it's federal government grants or other, you can actually be ready for, for FOIA or for just for audit. Um, obviously, the government can trace the goals and the KPIs and the milestones, can track the outcomes, um, and actually do all those things. I think that what cities are happy about is the fact that they can really know who has done what, they can trace the specific projects and they can then aggregate results based on goals of the city and see what were the results. Um, and maybe I will start with just with Sacramento as a case study. Uh, one of our first customers they started the COVID-19 with, um, with an intake form where they said, we have problems and we want to address those problems and we want to get solutions. And, they, and just by the fact that the mayor published this intake form, they got more than 100 proposals on our platform. And now they are engaging with the vendors and they are starting to deploy those projects. Not only that, now they are thinking to use our platform to manage all their um, CALZAC. Uh, funding. So they are going to use our platform to uh, get, uh, to manage, to get proposals for those projects, uh, mainly on affordable housing, homelessness, um, remote work, and uh, manage uh, those KPIs. On top of that, they have, um, we help them to structure all the unsolicited proposals. So when vendors are coming to the city and they, they bombard the city, everything is very structured. Choose one intake form and everything is in one place. And the relevant person in the city or the county is, is evaluate those proposals and decide what's the next step. Do they want to purchase it, to, run a, to a publish an RFI or an RFP, or to run a pilot? And if they're running a pilot, they are managing it on our platform. And the last interesting thing that they've done is they are running in internal innovation on our platform. So in the case of their utilities, they run a full 
hackathon on our platform and now they are managing the process and the projects on our platform. Another interesting uh, in, uh, case study is networks. So we are supporting networks of governments to work together on our platform. In this case, it was, it was 11 small cities that wanted to innovate around um, mobility and engagement with the public. And those 11 cities published their challenges and they got more than and they got 55 proposals on our platform. They, uh, they, they vet those uh, proposals, they score them, and they decided to interview nine of those vendors. And now they, they are actually running eight pilots with three of those vendors on our platform. And they are going to, um, and later on, they are going to purchase those solution. So this is just one example. I'm happy to share that we are working also with uh, 24 cities in Colorado. So Colorado Smart City Alliance. And just last week we signed with uh, the region of uh, Phoenix. So 28 uh, cities in Phoenix, uh, including Phoenix and the county. So this is another uh, use case where a group of uh, cities, it can be all the cities in one county, it can be regional, it can be around a specific topic, are working together and collaborate on uh, using our platform. Um, I think that what I wanted to mention in this slide is the effect. That we see ourselves as a community and we see ourselves as a way for governments to learn from each other. And every government that join us is actually we can we we leverage the data from this uh, from this um, from this to the benefit of the community. So we are learning what, what are the best vendors, what are the best solutions, uh, what is a good project, and we try to share this information with other cities. Uh, so the, the goal of the company is actually helping governments to move faster in better to get better results. Um, and today when a government is publishing a, a challenge, they are getting more and more responses because we are leveraging the power of the community. So for example, they say Planet M, they got more, they, they were there, they, um, a, a pilot project around COVID-19 and they got more than 100 proposals around, again, around mobility and food delivery for COVID-19. Now, once one of the city is using uh, OpenLip and try to get a similar results, they will, all those vendors will be in our database, they will get, and probably they are going to submit proposals uh, and we share the, the best practices with those agencies. So if we want to sum up, um, we are working with agencies all over the country. It can be from cities, towns, counties, the special district, uh, transit agencies, and even one state agency. And we help them to manage their process in order to bring innovation and adopt innovation much faster and much better. We help in different types of uh, segment from COVID-19 all the way to transportation, police, and planning. And we are, this is our, we, have, we are really focused. We are focused on helping governments to adopt innovation to the benefit of the of the residents and we are part of that and we would love to support you too so feel free to reach me out and um, thank you thank you very much Arik for the presentation really cool um, so I'm getting here questions in private chats and Q&A so I'll try to pick up like few that I think that are relevant and again uh, we invite I invite you in, in the name of all the startups you just heard uh, to reach out directly. So let's start with Michael uh, from Colo. So Michael, one of the questions here is if it has to be cities, if Colo also work with other organizations, so maybe you can address it just in one minute. Sure, so yeah, I mean, typically we work with cities, but we also work with Chambers of Commerce, uh, D DDA, like Downtown uh, Development Associations, uh, we're working sometimes with counties, really any um, agency or entity that can have that as a jurisdiction over um, specific uh, people. We typically want it to be uh, geographically contiguous. So it has to be maybe even if it's like two smaller municipalities, that could also be 
a potential um, and a client, I must say, but we want it to have an identity. So as long as we can maintain the identity, either through a Chamber of Commerce, DBA, a few cities that are nearby, maybe in a certain county, um, we can do that. And uh, I must say we are getting a few, uh, or actually numerous, uh, increase from counties actually recently who are looking for support. So, yes, to answer your question. Great, thank you for uh, standing in the challenge for one minute. Uh, Eyal from uh, Zen City. So again, many questions, but I think that the one point that comes out is people would be happy to know how do you minimize the bias uh, from the way that you collect the data? Um, definitely, I think it's, uh, it's a great question. Um, eliminating your bias is crucial in um, basing decisions on, on data like ours. And I think the uh, important part is that we analyze data that's already out there. So we don't ask questions, we don't uh, choose a sample, we basically listen to whatever conversations are already happening, whatever people are already reaching out on. Um, and in that sense, we portray the voice that is out there. Uh, of course, there is some bias in our data, uh, right? Not everybody uh, is active on uh, different social media platforms, not everybody reaches out to the city but the sheer volume of the data we analyze and sanity checks that we do over the composition of that data, seeing you know, how many uh, unique users are represented in the data that we analyze, um, basically uh, uh, shows us that we are able to catch significant parts of the population in uh, terms of 50% of and more on a monthly basis uh, being heard on our platforms. And specifically to the question on vulnerable communities that is being picked up here next, from our experience, we actually have an over-representation of vulnerable communities in comparison to any other um, tools that cities have for outreach today. For example, a lot of the um, tools like uh, uh, town hall meetings, et cetera, uh, exclude vulnerable communities uh, such as immigrant populations, uh, people that are, uh, can't leave the house, et cetera, et cetera. And our tools, because they follow digital conversations, actually have, have an over-representation on them in comparison to other tools. Thanks, Eyal. And one more last question for Arik. So if cities now want to learn about immediate solutions and not go through all of the process, do you have any kind of a COVID-19 kit or any information that you're already providing for cities that just try to you know, start the engagement process with you? That's actually a great uh, question, and I, I'm actually I'm uh, I should have mentioned it. Yes, we we collected uh, the top 40 um, uh, solutions out there, and we are providing it uh, to all our customers. And ba those, those, yeah, that's based on more than eight agencies that are working uh, that ask for for solutions. Um, so yes, we would love to share those. Uh, just reach out to me, and I would love to share those uh, this information with you guys. Wonderful, thank you as well, Arik. So uh, we want to be respectful for your time. Uh, so let me just conclude and say, first of all, thank you for the Israeli consulate for the Midwest. We really appreciate the opportunity and thank you to all of the participants. It was a pleasure and an honor. And we hope to bring this innovation from the startup nation uh, all the way from the Holy Land uh, to the USA. So thank you again, guys, and we'll be happy to reach out. We'll publish uh, this video soon enough. And, and thank you again. Good night and have a great day and have a great day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.